Hi friends, happy, happy Tuesday. I feel like it's still spring, but it feels like summer in New York City this week. Our weather, I don't know if it is for all of you where you're all at, but it has been like all over the place this weekend. It was 48 one morning, it was like 80 the next day. So right now it is really pretty out, but we might have clouds passing over. So it's been kind of that really funky, all over the place weather, but I also love spring. I do get a little allergy-ish, so I think you'll see I'll turn probably red later because I'm like almost like itching my, my skin, but it is so beautiful out when we go for, we do a walk, we have like a park by the water here where I live. It's like the flowers are out, there are more birds out. Fun side tip about, or fun fact about me, if you didn't know this, my fiance has gotten into birding over COVID, so I am, sort of like a now an avid birder without even meaning to. We go birding on the weekend. So I have seen all of these amazing birds you never would have knew, even lived uh, in New York City. The park we have has quite a ton of species. So this is not what our conversation is about today, but I'm very much in that like spring summery energy. And after we finish our live, I'm going for a run because it's been so gorgeous out. So. That is what's going on over here. You also tell me where in the world you are, how your weather is, if you're enjoying the spring. I know if you're on the Australia side of things, it's almost like the inverse with the weather. I have a few clients over there, and so you're getting you're getting more of the fall going into winter. Anyway, that's not what we're talking about today. That's just that's just where my head's at. I'm in in spring spring mode. What we are going to talk about today is money. So if you know me, you know I love talking about money. I love money, not in the way you would think. One of the reasons I love talking about money, and what we're going to talk about today, is I really find money is such a beautiful lens for us to be able to look at what's going on with you, with the mindset through. And I think in business, I think business is a beautiful lens too. I think. One of um, my good friends always talks about how business is like the crash course in personal development. And it's, I really believe as you're building, growing and scaling a business, what is being asked of you, as, yes, there's the practical strategy, but everything else that's being asked of you to be able to show up consistently to build, grow and scale a business is really this beautiful lens and opportunity for personal development and growth. And I think money is very much the same thing if you've heard me talk about money before, I talk a lot about how you do one thing is how you do all things. And I, the reason I'm prefacing that is because today we're gonna talk about uncovering, like uncovering the lessons from your money blocks. And I think sometimes what can happen when we're looking at something like money and particularly the so-called blocks, I don't really love that, that terminology, but I'm using it so that we're all on the same page because I, I think subconsciously we choose those blocks because they serve us. and. We'll get into that more. But I think what I find happens so often with something like money is it becomes so charged because of what we make those blocks mean, what we make it mean to have money, to not have money, to make money. There's a lot of meaning that gets put on top of money and a lot of meaning that gets put on top of making money. And then when we're in business, that becomes an extra layer of like what the money means. And it becomes this very hard, heavy charged thing. But I really think what's so powerful is because there's so much that gets up, wrapped up around money, is it becomes a vehicle, a really beautiful vehicle and lens we can use to look at what what is being put on top of this money? What is that charge around? What is that so-called block? What's really going on there? What are the lessons there? What? How can we use this as a lens to find out what's really going on, to address and to work through some of the layers underneath, to heal, shift, change what is underneath and causing what is showing, what is manifesting with those money blocks so that you can, yes, make more money, make more money on your terms. You know, we're all about that here, but also, and what we're going to talk about today is noticing that a lot of times, and this goes with looking at the money you're making, looking at the money you're charging, when you're having conversations with people around charging money, like the objections that come up, what I find so, 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 so often to be true, most of the time, it's not about the money at all when we're talking about money, most of the time it's about something else. And so that's that's what we're gonna talk about here today, just uncovering what are those lessons. So yes, uncovering the lessons, working through those so-called money blocks can set you up to make more money and to receive more money and to have more money and to keep more money, absolutely. But I think the beautiful thing, the reason I love talking about money so much is it really becomes this gift where if how we do one thing is generally how we do all things. And if money is really a lens to look at what's actually going on, that's going to serve you in so many ways outside of money alone. 
And it often also means the thing to solve, the thing to fix. There's nothing to fix, you're not broken. But the thing we're looking at, the thing that's blocked really has nothing to do with money at all. Let me know if this is making sense because I wanna make sure before we dive into to some of the things I really noticed around money, around coaching clients, as it relates to their money and their mindset. I wanna make sure we're on the same page and this is all making sense. And always, you know this, I'm sure if you've been here with me before, but I love questions. If you have a question, this time is for you, throw them at me. I'm always so happy to answer the questions. Let me know if anything isn't clear. That is my priority as we're chatting through this. Let me grab my water and just pull up a few notes here. So what I, I put in the preface here, what, what I wanted to talk about, and and what we're saying here is what I have noticed in every aspect of, actually, let me rewind the tape. I think this is just a good like baseline before we dive into uncovering the lessons from the money blocks because I, I do want to uncover those lessons and I'll share some insights that I really see have come up for me and have helped me to make more money and to scale my business to multi six figures, but also that I see with my clients that helps them, a lot of my clients make way more money than me, that has helped them really open themselves up to receiving more money and to hitting those multi five figure, six figure months, scaling their businesses and to keeping that money, sustaining that money. I think we were talking about it on the training last month. It's one thing to make money, which is a beautiful thing. It's a whole other thing what you do with that money and how you sustain your ability to make money. Um, but what I want to just kind of like as a baseline so we're on the same page, I think what's really helpful when we think about money and we're talking about what are those lessons around money is to remember that money itself is neutral. I talk a lot about neutrality in different ways. Money itself is neutral. It is a neutral commodity. It is something we use as an energy exchange. Back, back in the day, we traded hay bales and I don't know, bales of beer. Are there such thing as bales of beer? Barrels of beer we traded um spices you know we traded different commodities in exchange for goods in exchange for something we valued now we use pieces of paper because we don't even use pieces of paper anymore we use numbers on a screen that get we basically transfer monies on a screen back to each other numbers on the screen back to each other using internet um funds which i always find when you're getting wrapped up about money a really nice way to help take some of that charge out is to remember most of the time you're getting really stressed up or really worked up or really excited about a number that you're transferring back and forth between people on a screen. So that's a side tangent, but I think just a helpful like baseline here is remembering money itself is neutral and it's what we make money mean. It's what our perspective, our, you know, our energy, what we're putting on that money that gives it, turns it into a money block or turns it into a money lesson or turns it into something positive. But just remembering money itself is neutral. And so if we can keep remembering that, we can keep looking at, it's not, it's not really ever about the money. It's about what we're attaching to that money. And that's the thing, that's the lesson. Those are the lessons we wanna uncover and look at that we want to shift so you can make more money. Um, he says, hi, yes, it makes sense. Thank you, I appreciate you for saying that. Y'all know, I, I think I picked this up from my coach. She always asks, does this make sense? And I, I think it's one of the things I've heard so many times, I'm always asking, does this make sense to all of you and to my clients? Because I so much want to make sure you're getting the value from this. So I'll probably ask that 14 other times. I, I appreciate you for, for saying so. So with, with money, what can your, what can your, um, what lessons can we take from money blocks? So two thoughts here, and then we'll dive into some examples and some tools. The, the first thought is I was thinking about how I wanted to just share this and just kind of what we're talking about here that I just, I'm gonna repeat this, but it feels really important as a reminder. When we're looking at something like a money block and what I mean here is where it's like, wow, you get super stressed out about money. You feel like you can never make enough money. You don't even wanna look at your money. You feel like every time you make money, you wanna spend it all or give it all away. You feel super charged around money. You feel like you're always in scarcity. You hate the way you make money. You think that money is evil. You think that money is bad. You think that money, people with money are greedy. I think there's a lot we can uh, attach to money. So I think it's really helpful just to start to notice what are some of those stories you have around money. And kind of the preface we're gonna use for today's live is noticing whatever your whatever's coming up when we when i ask you what does money mean to you how do you feel about money what do you think about money you can share it with me if you want to you don't have to but noticing when whatever comes up there what i want you to take a moment to do is to step back and realize what you're saying literally has nothing to do about money money has just become the place for you to take the story and 
to, you know, to, to basically, it's the lens you get to look at the story through. And I want to invite you to like notice this because this is going to help you on the selling side and business making money as well. When someone tells you something about this is um, anything coming up around money, it's really helpful to notice most of the time made up stat nine out of 10 times, 85% uh, of the time, it's really not about the money at all. It's about something else. So it's kind of our baseline here. This, um, I've been on a kick revisiting some of Byron Katie's, the work. I don't know if any of you know her work. She has some really powerful questions and then she does, you ask these questions and then you kind of invert them and it's really helpful for unpacking limiting beliefs. But one of the questions that she asks in this is, who would you be without this thought? Um, and so I think it can be really helpful. And this is this is not the main lesson, but I think it's just a helpful place for us to start. If you start to think about, mm, this is how I think about money. I think there's never enough. I can never make enough money. I can't make that much money. It's really hard for me to make money. Um, every time I make money, it goes away. Um, it's not safe to make money. I, I think people with money always are bitchy. People with money are always bragging. Whatever's coming up for you, I think it's really interesting to pause and ask yourself, who would I be without this thought? Because what I notice for myself and for so many of my clients, whatever you have coming up around money, those money blocks, it's really fascinating how much we want to identify with our money block as being true and how often this is something, it's almost like even if it doesn't consciously serve you, even if in reality it doesn't serve you, there's an element where it's like we cling on to this because it's so much a part of our identity and who we are and how we interact with other people. And it also tends, I find, for money or not, whenever there is a belief you have that on the surface isn't serving you and getting you what you want, on a subconscious level, underneath the surface, it is helping you get what you want. It is meeting a need. And so what I find is really interesting in playing with this idea of who would you be without this thought? Who would you be without the money block you're identifying? So if you think about some of those money blocks or the way you interact with money, who would you be if that weren't the case? Who would you be if that weren't the thought? What would like, and, and really sitting with that for a moment because what that will start to teach you is what the real work to do is. And it's really fascinating what can come up. You don't have to share. I know some of this is vulnerable. You can if you want to, and I will go through some examples. But I think it's just really fascinating to notice, oh, wow, well, if I didn't have that, then fill in the blank. Maybe it's like, oh my gosh, I'd be free to do whatever I wanted, and that feels terrifying. Or, oh my gosh, then I'd like, I'd have to take I have to take a look at this other thing in my life that feels really scary or oh my gosh I'd have to take personal responsibility for my money or oh my gosh I would have to realize like I need to like love on myself a little bit more I think it's really interesting to notice just what comes up around that um, also side note I'll, I'll um, try to remember to link to it unless someone wants to grab it but um, link to Byron Katie's the work it really for all of you who are coaches and even if you're not a coach if you got something you want to use as a tool I find it's, it was revisiting this with a client today and just such a powerful framework for ident looking at beliefs and unpacking them and, and then noticing or uh, shifting some of them. Um, Katie Lee says, loving your updated office, looking so chic. Oh, thank you. Um, we moved to uh, Dumbo. So I have, we're in a big loft, uh, loft building now. So one of my challenges was we can't, this is such a side tangent, but we're not allowed to paint the walls here because it's a historically protected building. It's an old shoe warehouse and like crazy high ceilings, which is fun, but we're not allowed to paint and do certain things. So I had to figure out how to work that like, it is very white on white on white on here. So thank you for saying that. Ruth says many people are brought up to think money is bad and shouldn't be talked about, which makes it a taboo subject for many, a thousand percent. Um, and we're gonna get into that for a second. And, and I should be mindful here to say, as we're talking about uncovering the lessons in your money block today, um, I think money is one of those topics. It is so, there's a lot we can unpack here. And I wanna be mindful to say, we're obviously not going to cover everything on this live today. And that feels very, very important. We're, I'm, we're looking at one angle here, but I wanna make sure I'm, you know, for anyone who's watching, if you're like, oh, well, we didn't talk about this. Does that mean that's not valid or that's not a thing? I think this is one of those topics we can look at in a lot of different ways and that can have many layers to it. And to what Ruth was saying, I think just something that can be helpful for everyone as well is depending on how you were raised, what your upbringing was, what 
society, you know, I think society as a whole can make money very taboo. I think depending on your smaller world, how you grew up, money can have its own way that it's talked about that can very much impact the way you view money and so that kind of brings us to the next thing. Um, so Ruthie set me up beautifully. And uh, Katie says Dumbo is my favorite. I love Dumbo so much, I love it. Um, I love it here so much. I'm so glad you know it. If you're ever out here, we'll have to, um, cause I know you don't live here, but if you're ever out here, Katie, we'll have to we'll have to go hang by the, the water and get a drink. Um, so Ruth set me up really beautifully here. So what I find, and one of the biggest lessons I find we can learn from our so-called money blocks is and something I have noticed in myself and that I have noticed in clients when we're talking about money is when we start to peel back the layers, now that we're kind of all on the same page here, we start to look at, you know, who would you be if this thought weren't true? Who would you be without this thought? But also when we start to look at what's really going on, if we kind of are on the same page, that it's rarely actually about the money. So often I find what your money blocks, the lessons it uncovers, it's, and again, this is not the whole thing. This is one thing we're gonna talk about today. But what I find is that it often will give you insight into the mindset work you really need and particularly often what the younger version of you really needs to hear from you and needs support around. So I think Ruth set us up nicely because she was, she was speaking to how much society can maybe say money is taboo. But if you think about how were your parents about money? What did you learn about money growing up? What did you learn from school about money? what circles were you in and how was money talked about or not talked about? What did you make money mean? As a younger child, this is where a lot, I mean, most of our subconscious mind and our beliefs and our identity and the way we see the world is shaped by the age of 10. Of course, we can shift this. Our brain is malleable. We can change our beliefs. But if we're not consciously taking a look at this, just kind of what's running on under the surface on autopilot, a lot of these beliefs and stories are formed by about the age of 10. So as adults running businesses, when now money is coming up in different ways and we're feeling charged about it or we're feeling stucky, we're like, why am I so fucking frustrated with money? Or I wanna bury my head in the sand or it feels so hard to make money or I feel like there's never enough. What I find is so often the beautiful lesson there and the beautiful thing we can uncover is, oh my goodness, whatever is under this often is also, I know some people call it inner child work, depending on how you like like to think about it, but I really like to think about it as like, oh, there's a part of me, a younger part of me, that probably really needs some attention. And whatever's coming up for me around money, if we believe money is neutral, and if we believe that sometimes when we choose things, even if on the surface they don't serve you, they are getting some sort of need met. I always tell my clients if, if, if they're like, oh, why do I believe this or why do I do this? And they wanna give themselves a hard time. I'm like be easy on you. Anything you believe, anything you do, even if on the surface it doesn't serve you, there is a subconscious part of you that is trying to get its needs met, that is trying to stay safe, that is trying to feel accepted, that is trying to feel loved, that is trying to have something met. I mean, I know this is all making sense. Um, so I always think this is a place where it's like, we get to have so much grace and compassion but then instead of walking around chanting a bunch of money affirmations when we're frustrated with money, which I love me a good money affirmation, not knocking money affirmations, I love them. But if we're feeling frustrated with money and feeling in scarcity or feeling tight around it or feeling stressed around it or feeling whatever's coming up for you around it and we just slap on, I'm a millionaire, I'm a millionaire, I'm a millionaire, it's really easy for me to make money on top of that, so often we're missing the very work and thing that needs to be looked at and shifted and healed for lack of a better way to say it. And again, if we know that everything you do in some way is trying to get your needs met, even if on the surface it's like, this doesn't seem like it's getting my needs met, subconsciously it is, what the lesson we can unwind is, what we can find out is like, hey, you're getting a message of like, this is the thing I really need there's a younger part of me, or maybe it's an adult part of you, but I'm finding out what I actually need. So yes to the affirmations, yes to doing, you know, like changing those beliefs on the surface level, but for those to stick, where we're probably gonna see the most powerful shifts and the most powerful work is to look at, oh, wait, this actually has nothing to do with money at all. What I'm needing right now is some love and attention. What I'm needing right now is to feel safe. What I'm needing right now is to feel acceptance. What I'm needing right now is not to feel all this pressure and responsibility. These are the real things I need to give myself 
this is the real work to do. And if I do this work, like the lovely thing is the money piece will actually take care of itself because remember, it's rarely actually about the money. It's more about what's underneath that that's getting kicked up when things are feeling so charged around money. Let me know if that makes sense, questions, if that lands, if that's confusing, because I wanna make sure that is making sense. What I find the other part here, so um, what do you call it, inner child or, or younger self, but just like, just keep remembering that where it's like, so like just getting curious, and it might not be, maybe it is, this is a surface level money thing. Sometimes money is just a really practical tool, but what I find is when it is about the money, like the money itself and not about something else, it's generally not as charged it generally feels a lot more neutral. If I'm practically looking at my money and I'm practically looking at where to invest it or you know what I'm going to pay for something or if I'm looking at something and it's just a practical, like this isn't even like an energy exchange, I'm looking at what to do with my money, I know I'm looking at my money as a tool, as a resource, as a commodity and it's when it's neutral and that, that's just the way I'm looking at it. When there's a charge coming up around it, when it's feeling heavy, tight, like when there's just that emotionality around it, that's when we have a really good idea where it's like this might be about something else. And I think that can be just a, a great gauge. It's sort of like in your business with um, strategy. If you're like, mm, does this, is my strategy need some attention? Is there something going on with my strategy? Or is there something going on with my mindset? A really great gauge can be, am I feeling a big charge around this? If I'm feeling a big charge around this, it doesn't mean your strategy might not need a look, but it tells us that means there's something mindset going on that needs to be addressed first. And then if there's still something going on, you can take a look at the strategy. But if there's really no charge around it and there's not a bunch of emotionality going on around it, that's how we generally know, oh, this might actually just be a, a neutral strategy thing to look at. So kind of the same thing with money. So with the, um, with the money piece, and when we look at like what's the lesson that this is trying to tell you, because I always think, I think of, so I don't love the term blocks, but I use it intentionally because I think that's how we get on the same page. I really think so often when we have limiting beliefs or when we have so-called mindset blocks or money blocks, it's really our brain's way of telling us, like, hey, pay attention, this is the thing I need. This is the thing I need from you. Um, you're not gonna pay attention to me any other way. So it might just be a more fun light, I think it can be really powerful with money, with our mindset in general, to bring in some levity instead of making things feel so heavy. I think we just spin out and it's like, oh, this is a block, I'm doing things wrong. Instead of like, oh, like, hey, my like brain is just knocking at the door trying to get my attention. Like, oh, hi brain, I'm listening to you. Okay, what's up? What do you need from me? And I think that can just bring in a little more levity. What I often see with money when we're talking like, what are the lessons it can teach you? What are the things your younger self might be screaming and asking for? A lot of times I find when it comes to money, it's often safety or self-protection, um, a way to get needs like self-love acceptance met, or it's a part of like an identity, like a, how you see yourself an identity thing. So I'll give some examples here. Um, Oh, I made a note here, so I'll share this before I give my examples. The big note I made for myself, I put a big asterisk because I often just riff and don't actually look at my notes. But the reason I'm sharing this this way with you and the reason I want to invite you to think about money blocks this way and to think about what are the lessons from your money blocks is this really helps you address the, the real thing, the real thing going on. Because remember, if how we do one thing is how we do most things, not all things, but most things. Money might be where you're noticing whatever your younger self is asking you for, whatever pattern is being kicked up, whatever so-called block is like screaming at you. But my guess is this is showing up all over your life. And so it can be really helpful when you can address this because then you know, like then you know the real thing to address for yourself, the real way to take care of yourself, the real way to self-soothe, the real mindset work to do. And it's going to benefit you everywhere. So yes, it'll benefit you with money. It's like, then you know the actual thing to solve instead of like, oh my gosh, how do I just like push myself and try to sell more? It's like, oh, I need to create the safety here. I need to love on myself more. And that's actually gonna make it easier to make money. But you'll say, you'll see this also ripples out into how you feel with your clients, how you feel with your team, how you feel like relationships out, we have a relationship with money, right? So like relationships you have outside of business. And so I think it's just really powerful in that way, but it also helps you to actually look at 
and kind of solve the right thing instead of getting wrapped around something that actually doesn't need your attention. And I find most of us get so frustrated and feel stuck, whether we're looking at money or looking at things in business, because we're trying to solve something that really doesn't need to be solved. I was talking with a client today about this with money, and it was just really interesting where we were talking about how, like, how like, his money hasn't changed that much, but the way he feels about his money and the safety around it and the safety and being able to make money and the ease in which making money and the ease in which he, like he's working in business and like the hours he's working, everything around it has changed. And it's kind of what we're talking about here, which kind of shows you like money was never actually the thing. But when we started working together, money was the thing. It felt very scarce. It felt very hard to make. It didn't feel safe. And it's just so fascinating to see how often that's really not the thing. There's usually something else going on. And when you shift that, it can change everything. All right, hopefully that makes sense. That feels important. And then the last one I was gonna make there is, and then just remember, this is also true for you when you're having sales conversations. I know I mentioned that at the beginning of the call, but if this is true for you, it's going to be the same thing when you're chatting with potential clients and something comes up around money or making an investment or around pricing or when you're setting your pricing. And noticing like all the stuff that can come up around that is rarely about the number itself. I cannot tell you how much I've seen that to be true in my business. At every price point in my business and when I'm selling, like it's rarely, 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 rarely about the number itself. Uh, and I think you can just notice, the more you can notice that in yourself and do this work, the easier it is to support potential clients through that and to have those conversations when you're in a sales conversation and not to get kind of hooked by that surface story that people are believing and wanting to tell you because you're no longer hooked by your surface story that you're wanting to fight for. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, so I really think these things are gifts for us because they help us shift so much. And I think it's, it's sort of like if you think about a crying kid, when a kid is crying, a kid's crying because it's trying to tell you something when, before, before a child can speak. And we can get super frustrated at the kid for crying or we can be like, oh, I'm so glad that my child is crying because it's helping me understand like this is the only way my child knows how to communicate what its needs are. I would think about that a little bit here where it's like, oh, this is frustrating, this doesn't feel good, but if this is my inner child, if this is my younger self, this is the way it knows how to communicate with me. Okay, so let's, let's talk about a few examples. So one of the examples I think that can come up quite a bit in business is kind of when you're getting stuck in that victim mode of like whining about money, not that you're trying to be a victim, but just that mode where it's like, oh, it's so hard to make money. I never make enough money. It's easy for everyone else. Why is this so hard for me? Like this sucks. I never have enough. When we're kind of in that space, I think it's really interesting to play with. So who would you be without that thought? And the reason we can start with who would you be without that thought or who would you be without that story is it's really interesting to notice like what part of you wants to cling on to it where if you're like oh i'd be great like fine but i find for a lot of us when we're like oh but then how would i get attention how would i get someone telling me things are going to be okay how would i like you'll start to notice like, that'll help you identify like what are some of the ways that this helps you get your needs met um i think you can also be interesting to look at where did i learn this is this something i picked up and learned and if so when I picked up and learned this let's say mom did this let's say dad did this god god bless them like parents are always doing the best they know how with the resources they have I know I'm a stepmom I call myself a bonus mom I'm always doing the best I know how with the resources I have I'm sure I'm getting it wrong all the time that is just part of being a parent um and I'm still doing it right because I'm trying so this is not to make any parent wrong but I think it's just interesting to notice what did I, like, where did I learn this? What did I make this mean? What did I witness? Did I witness when someone complains about money? Like, what happened there? What, like, what was that exchange I noticed? Did, that, did I notice when that happened? Hugs were given. Did I notice when that happened? We had a big fight, but it was really exciting in the house. Did I just, like, notice this is, like, the normal thing, and this is what I, like, this feels really safe and comfortable for me, because everything was actually always okay. I have no idea what anyone here's situation is, but I think it's just interesting to look at and just to notice like, where did I learn this somewhere? Where did I learn this? What did I make this mean? What needs were being met here? 
an exercise I'll often have clients play with is to journal to, sometimes we'll do this on a call, where it's like, what do you think your younger self needed? needs to hear around this? What do you think your younger self wants to say? Is there something they didn't get to say in this situation when they were learning this? Like, can we give them an opportunity to speak? It's gonna be a great thing to journal around because this can be a way to unpack some of this and also to hear like, does your younger self feel trapped by this but like just needs to vocalize something around this? Or is there something they're asking for, a place they're not being heard? I think it's gonna be really nice to do for those of you who are coaches as well, like a really nice thing to do in conversation, but it can be a really great thing to journal around as well and to really give your younger self, to think of yourself almost like I am parenting my younger self. I am a parent to my younger self. Let me like sit down with my younger self, be a parent, parent to her. What does she need to tell me about this? What needs, like, does she have here? Like what is coming up for her? So that is just an example of one of the places I notice this can come up various things that can come up around that but just to give you some like give you some insight in some places you can look at and some ways you can start to die like not to make this wrong if you were talking to your young if you were talking to a little kid you would never be like oh my gosh i can't believe you want that or you need that or you don't know how to ask for that why are you crying you would never i, well, I don't think anyone here would yell at their kids for that right so same with yourself because i think what we do as adults is we want to give ourselves a really fucking hard time we're like why do i still have this pattern why is this showing up and you would never, ever, ever, ever consciously on purpose talk to a kid that way. So I think this can be really helpful to play with this in terms of if I'm going to be a parent to my younger self, can I let my younger self talk? What does he or she need to say to me? What does he or she need to vocalize? What does he or she need? Can I give them room to, to speak? And then can I affirm? Can I let them know I hear them? Can I let them know they're safe? And can I help get those needs met? So this is one of like, what can those, what are those lessons our money blocks can uncover? I think what you can start to find out then is you're gonna start to really see, oh, holy shit. I did not even know I had this unmet need that I need to give myself. Oh my gosh. So something I noticed, I, I I always share with you, like I walk my talk, right? Like this is the work I'm doing. This is the stuff I'll journal around. Something I uncovered recently, I was like, holy shit, I did not even realize something I needed to give myself was a little more spaciousness and a little more like, hey, you're doing a really great job. Like go take a break. Like literally did not even realize that until I was doing an exercise around this and looking at some of this. And so I share that because I think it's always just helpful to hear um, examples, but also to hear transparently, like, I'm sharing this with you now, because this is like a fun, like where I'm just like, what topic should we talk about today? But like, I'm always looking at like, what am I actually chatting with clients about? What's the work I'm doing behind, you know, behind the scenes? And I think it's nice for you to see, I just celebrated a 38K cash months. I have already, I don't know, we're at like 130K this year cash in the business. And I'm still looking at blocks coming up. I'm still looking at charge coming up. I'm still looking at these things coming up and I will continue to do so at every level. I think there's a little way in which we think at a certain place, I'm never going to have to look at this stuff again or at a certain place it'll go away or at a certain level, this like won't serve me or like, I'm going to like, this will just be done. And I just want to offer that's not the case. This shows up at every level and allowing yourself to do this work and to find new ways to get those needs met and to parent your, your younger self is also how you get to the next level and how you keep growing and how you start creating more safety around making money, receiving money, having money. Um, hey Marissa, for some reason it told me you were live, so I'm just gonna say a big hello to you because I know you're here. It's so nice to have you on. Okay, so let me see. Um, Oh, so I think what's just helpful here to see is yes to affirmations, yes to like, I love to do some future gratitude around money and you know affirmations around that, but I think it's really helpful to see if you're just walking around saying, I'm a millionaire, I'm a millionaire, people love to pay me money, I'm a millionaire, like great affirmations, but if the younger part of you is like, yeah, but if we become a millionaire, like that actually feels really fucking scary and like, you're gonna have to work all the time and you're not gonna have any spaciousness and um, you're not gonna ever have a break or you're not gonna be loved and people are gonna stop wanting to be friends with you. Like there's going to be a disconnect. Um, and so it's almost gonna, like we have to think like, you don't get what you say you want, you get what you actually want. Your subconscious mind is driving, is steering the ship 98% of the time. So if underneath 
if we're not taking a look at that and addressing and healing some of that, not that affirmations don't work, but I think this is why people can get really frustrated with affirmations sometimes. It's like we kind of have to do them in tandem. Um, Marissa says, hi, listening while I'm making dinner. Oh, I'm so glad I get to hang with you while you're making dinner. I'm also impressed that you're making dinner. As a New Yorker, I know um, I am a New Yorker. We do cook more now in this apartment, but I have to say we are we are definitely people who also are typical New Yorkers who order out a lot. Ruth says, I'm in interested, Kim. What sort of money affirmations do you do? Ooh, that's, okay, I'm gonna answer that and then I'll go back to some other examples. So money affirmations, I do love money affirmations. And I'm also a big fan of, I call it brainwashing. So I really believe that, I don't believe, this is just science, like repetition, what we put into our brain more often, like repetition is how we create new neural pathways in our brain. So I do practice a lot of affirmations and I call it brainwashing in that whenever, and I tell clients this all the time, whenever I have free time, when I'm doing my makeup, when I'm making coffee, when I am actually making dinner, when I'm going for a walk, I really focus on actively programming my brain with, oh, don't mind my hand, there was a message that popped up on my phone, um, programming my brain with affirmations and consciously choosing the thoughts I want to believe. And I find that is very powerful. So not overriding the work that, that needs to be done that we're talking about here, but really like using that active time to essentially brainwash myself with the beliefs I wanna have because we're thinking so many thoughts a second and so many of our thoughts can be really shitty if we're not being mindful. So I do think affirmations can be powerful. Um, so I practice them. I call it brainwashing. I believe if the, what was it? What's the Netflix special um, with the creepy, horrible cult guy, um, The Vow? If, you know, people can essentially be brainwashed into cults, we can brainwash ourselves to believe what we want and it can be really powerful. I also, and then I'll give you some actual affirmations, but I also, um, so right before you fall asleep and right before you wake up in the morning, that's when your brain is, that's when you're most connected to, the conscious and subconscious are most connected. So I'm also really mindful to practice affirmations and to be really conscious of my thoughts during those times because I know that's when I'm connecting. Like that's my most powerful time for retraining my brain and for rewiring the beliefs I wanna believe. So some of my favorite money affirmations. I'm a big fan of framing them in terms of, I'm so grateful that, or I'm celebrating that, or oh my gosh, it's so amazing that, because when, uh, in terms of like rewiring the brain, what they have shown is when you, repetition is one of the ways we create new memories and new neural pathways, but so is a memory with heightened emotion. It's why if you've had a traumatic experience, that can come up so often that so those memories are so imprinted in the brain it's also why really big moments in your life are usually easier for you to bring up because there's heightened emotion attached to that gratitude is a more heightened emotion celebration is a more heightened emotion i'm like so excited that oh my god like that kind of emotion it's going to help for everyone who's doing affirmations this is like such a side tangent on our live today so i hope this is helpful for everyone but it's going to help those affirmations click in more um so i like to do money affirmations in terms of like, I'm so incredibly grateful that I'm making whatever that amount of money I'm, I'm growing into in my business. I love to do affirmations like pe people love to pay me. I'm so grateful my clients love to pay me. I'm so grateful it feels so good to receive money doing work I love. I'm celebrating whatever that money month is. I will also do quite a few, um, so in terms of money affirmations, I really believe that so much of making money, keeping money is also about reception and being open to receive and expanding our capacity to receive. So I do affirmations around I'm open to receive, I'm expanding my capacity to receive love, success, joy, money. So I do a lot of affirmations around that as well. And then kind of to what we're talking about today, a lot of times my money affirmations aren't always literally about money. Um, though I will, one more I will say, I like to also um, affirm that it feels really good to live in overflow. So I really like to think about money as overflow. That's something that I've just been playing with because it used to feel really scary to me. And it used to feel really like there used to get a lot kicked up for me. So I like to write how grateful I am for overflow, but how much I love living in overflow. But this is kind of to what we're talking about here, Ruth. Um, I will also, because I'm doing the work on like what's coming up for me around money, I will try to include affirmations that speak to that. So for me, if it, if it used to not feel safe to be an overflow, I will, I will say it feels so safe to be an overflow. 
if maybe I didn't, um, I think one of the really big blocks that can come up around money when you kind of unpack what's going on can be a lack of safety. And it can be a form of self-protection to not want to make a lot of money or to create money drama. Or I think some people believe if I create drama, that's what spurs me into action so I can make more money. I think some people feel like if I make a lot of money, I'm gonna have more responsibility. I'm gonna have to pay for everything. I'm gonna have to pay for more taxes. I'm, um, people won't like me. I'm gonna have to work a lot more. And so it can feel not safe and it can be a form of literally protection from your brain where it's like, we're not gonna make more money. Why the fuck would we want any of that? So kind of going to the affirmations, I will like, depending on what's coming up, I'll, I'll write affirmations or say affirmations around, it's so safe to make lots of money. It, it is so safe to live in overflow. It's so safe if someone asks for a refund. I don't know, like whatever thing might be coming up for you. So I will play with the affirmations as well around that. And then kind of to what we were talking about earlier, also looking at what are some of those needs that need to be met. So if let's say it is that safety piece, that's a need you want to make, right? Like how can I create more safety? for myself, how can I create more safety overall in my life and in my business, and maybe do an affirmation around that. But let's say you take a look at what's coming up for you around money and you're like, oh, well, isn't this fascinating? I have a whole thing coming up around money where I'm like, I think people won't like me if I make money. I think people won't love me. I think if I make more money, um, people on the internet will hate me or think I'm a bitch or whatever these things are. I think it's really interesting to, this is a little bit um, similar to Byron to Katie's work where it's like turning that around where it's like, do you think that about you? I might be a bitch if I make money. I don't like me. I don't love me. Um, because we can really, I, um, in the work with Byron Katie's work, one of the things she does is how do you turn around your limiting belief statement on yourself? Um, so if you're like, um, so-and-so is a jerk you would turn it around. She has you do like the, the inverse of it. The turnaround would be like, I am a jerk. Um, that's what you believe. So here where it's like, oh my gosh, I think if I make lots of money, I'm using her tool and extrapolating this here for us. Um, I don't think this is how she intended it, but I think it works really well here. Oh my gosh, if I make lots of money, what I'm actually noticing is younger me thinks everyone will hate me and not like me and not wanna be my friend anymore. People not like me. I think it, you can see then, oh, if we do the inverse, I don't like me, I don't love me. I don't think I'm enough. You know, like we can really identify like what is actually the core block going on for you and that becomes the work to do. So Ruth, going back to your question, I think that's a great place to dialogue with your younger self, but with affirmations, then that would also be where I'd wanna do affirmations. They might not be specifically around money, but it's sort of like, it's often not about the money, it's about the thing under the thing. And so I might identify there, oh, I need to love me more. Like I am not loving myself enough. So my affirmations might be, I love you, Kim. I love you, you're so fucking amazing, you're so wonderful. If it were around enoughness, it might be, Kim, you are so good enough. If it were around, you know, whatever, I think um, some of my clients have a lot around um, control as well, which I think goes back to the safety piece. So um, Ruth, that was like the longest winded answer for you, so I hope, I know it wasn't just affirmations, but I think it's nice to understand the thinking behind them so everyone listening so you can see like yes affirmations are powerful but this way you can use them in a way where it's really helping to rewire the things you want to shift and that kind of goes back to the point of the conversation here where it's seeing like the money block isn't a bad thing it's really a great insight for you to see what is the thing you actually need and using some of these tools here where it's like what does my younger self need or if i inverse what's coming up here so for example, I think people might hate me. If I make lots of money, that means I, like inverted to like, I hate me if I make lots of money. You see, holy, holy shit, here's, here's the work, here is the place to really dive in. Instead of, I think what so often we wanna do is get stuck trying to actually solve the money itself. And what I find is the more we can address what's going on underneath, the easier it is for the money to solve itself. I have seen this in my business, the, it's almost like the less I stress and focus on the money piece and the more I focus on the stuff underneath, the easier it is to show up and make money. Because remember, money itself is actually pretty neutral. And if we, if, for those of you who are manifesting energy people, if we believe that when you're in a different energy, it's easier to attract, and we attract what we think, we attract what we believe, when you're shifting these things, if something here is like, I actually kind of don't like myself, and I hate myself, if we're shifting that into I love myself and my work now is I'm gonna fucking love myself, um, of course that's going to be an energy that's going to attract 
someone who loves themselves. You know, like that's just gonna be a different energy that attracts more. In. Okay, um, let's see. Ruth says overflow. I love that. Thanks. I found that very interesting and powerful. Funny you keep talking about younger self. I've been doing a lot of inner child work over the last year. I love that the overflow part landed with you. It is, I think, such a fun way to think about think about money and interesting for everyone watching just an interesting place to notice too what comes up for you when you hear the word overflow is it just like oh yeah that feels great cool you don't have a charger on it is it where you're like oh there's something coming up that feels hard that feels challenging actually i have all this stuff attached with overflow i think it's just a really again where it's like we don't have to make that a bad thing but i think just interesting to notice because i know for some of my clients when we talk oh my chair is cracking um we talk about overflow sometimes some things can come up and again just seeing that is like what's the lesson you can uncover from what that charge is telling you and i'm so glad this felt interesting and powerful and the younger self piece and the inner child work so it really can be so powerful and i think it's for for those of you because I'm, I'm like throwing these terms around like everyone here understands what inner child work is but i, I think just understanding like there's a a theory of what we're talking about here is just this idea that all of us have an inner child, a younger, a younger part of us inside of us. And a lot of times when we're talking about mindset work and we're talking about healing things, that younger part of you, it's not like it doesn't go away. Um, and oftentimes that when we're doing mindset work, I think it can be really powerful to look at what is that younger you, what is that inner you? Like, like this is where a lot of childhood so-called, you know, wounds, sometimes they're there it's sometimes it's trauma with a capital t lowercase t but a lot of times there can be things we picked up in childhood and learned and it's still there right it, just because you're an adult it doesn't mean suddenly like childhood is left behind and so when we're doing work here a lot of times it is yes looking at things i guess that came up in childhood but really working with that younger part of you and dialoguing with that and doing some work to create safety for that younger part of you and i think it can be really 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 powerful work i think it can also help um michael singer talks about this really well in the untethered soul when he talks about being in that observer role with yourself and i think it's a really powerful place when we think about mindset work so often when i think about mindset work and when i'm talking to clients about this we just think we are our thoughts and we get so like hooked like us thoughts like we're just like fused together and when we can create a little bit of separation, we can see we are not our thoughts. We have the power to choose new thoughts. Um, like, like we are not our mind, that sort of a thing. And he talks a lot, Michael Singer and the Untethered Soul, about being that observer of your thoughts. And so the more you can almost create that separation and get outside of yourself and observe your thoughts, the more you're in a place of power, the more you're in your higher self, where you can consciously choose what you want. That's when we can consciously choose our actions. That's when we can slow down our thinking a little bit and not be so reactive. That's when we can really manage our mind instead of having our mind manage us. Most of the time, most of us are running on autopilot. 95, 90%, 98% of your thoughts are coming from your subconscious mind, right? So your mind is kind of ruling you. When you can get into observer mode, you're sort of ruling your mind. And so I think with inner child work, what's really powerful is it really gets you into that observer role. It helps create a little separation. It's very similar to any, for any of you who've ever um, played with your, um, I, I call her my inner bitch, but that, that inner mean girl, the mindset gremlins, and you've named them and you've given them names and personas. Whenever you're doing that, what you're doing is you're creating a little separation so you can get into observer role, so you can dialogue with that inner bitch, so you can dialogue with your inner child. And that separation is so powerful because it starts to put you into your conscious seat so you can consciously choose the thoughts, so you can consciously rewire your brain, so you can consciously meet your needs, which is usually how we can meet our needs in healthier ways, versus subconsciously meeting your needs, which is usually coming from that inner child, that younger part of you, the subconscious mind, that is, remember, most of our subconscious mind is formed by the age of 10, so a lot of times, all of us are running around as adults, running businesses with a 10-year-old brain, trying to get our needs net, needs met the way a 10 year old would and if you think about my bonus son is 10 so i know how he needs he tries to get his needs met he is a very self-aware and very mature 10 year old and he's still a 10 year old um so if you think about like what do 10 year olds do to get their needs met it's not the same thing we would say a healthy adult would always do to get their needs met and so i think it can just help you see when you create create that separation you can also um, it helps you to choose consciously, choose healthier ways to get those needs met, start to shift and rewire the brain and create some of that, that separation. I think it can also help you to see like, oh, that's why I do this. That's why this feels so hard. That's like, I didn't even realize that. 
I cry because I know that when I cry, yes, it feels so soothing to be like, that might get me a hug. I'm, I'm making this up for, for someone here. I'm, I'm for someone here. Like I get super pissed about this because I, 10 year old me knew when they got super pissed and stomped around, mom gave them a hug, mom bought them something. So I think it can also just be like, it can help you just like identify and say, like, oh, this isn't even about what's going, like I don't even have to stress about this here. This is what's really going on. Now let me be the adult to myself to my inner child and choose something differently. Um, Ruth says, oh, I just finished The Untethered Soul, but just couldn't get into it. You know, Ruth, the first time I read it, I felt that way. I could not get into it. I was like, this, this just isn't my, like, I really think books choose us sometimes and we have to be like, like a, I have plenty of books like that where it's like the first time I'm like, not the right time, just didn't do it. And then I picked it up later and it's been like, this is, the best thing that has ever happened to my life. Untethered Soul is one of those. It's one of my favorite books. The first time I read it, it just wasn't my thing. Same with um, uh, David Hawkins' work. I I think if you're a client of mine, there's a good chance I've sent you one of his books. The first time I read his books just was not clicking. Obsessed with them now, have read or listened to them on repeat, send them to most of my clients. So I totally hear where you're coming from, Ruth. Um, uh, Dante, hey, what's up? Nice to see you on. Uh, so fun when I get to see see friendly faces. Okay, just seeing here because I I always feel like I'm like today I'm gonna be really concise and really brief and I'm gonna share this in 20 minutes and then 51 minutes in I'm like wow there's so much more I want to share with you. Dante says how are you? I'm doing really wonderful. How are you? Happy happy Tuesday. Thanks for being here. Um, so what I'm going to I'm gonna give you one more real quick example and then we sort of talked through the tools here, but I did wanna make sure I left you with some tools to put this into practice. Thank you for the love, Dante. Um, the other example here, cause I feel like we've been talking through different examples to look at, but one of the other places I really see this opportunity, the lessons you can uncover from your mindset blocks is what ha comes up around scaling. So I think it's really fascinating Scaling is just a really interesting, I think it's just again, like every, building your business, building that foundation, opportunity for growth, opportunity to look at what's going on with your mind. Scaling, another opportunity. I find it's just another place where it's like, oh, really interesting. I did not know these mindset gremlins were here. I did not know these blocks were here. Like, isn't that fascinating? And I think just a lot, a lot can come up. And I say that just to normalize it because I find for scaling, like, yes, there's some practical practical stuff and I chat with clients about that and maybe we'll do a live around that soon. But I find so much of it is the mindset work too. Um, I think it's a pretty common thing in the online space where we say at a certain point in scaling your business, everything goes down to mindset work and delegating. Um, like that's not the whole, whole thing, but that's a lot of it. And a lot of it is looking at, oh, what are these lessons I can uncover here? And I, I find, and for everyone here, it might be very different. So I'm not like, saying like, this is the thing that comes up for you. But I find with scaling, like it can just be interesting again to see like, what is the block? What is the story coming up there for you? And sometimes there's a helpful way to get clear on that is like, what am I, what am I scared is gonna happen if, if I do scale, if I do make more money? Um, and so a couple, cause I work with a, quite a few high achievers, not, not all my clients self identify, but that is a commonality. And something I find comes up a lot for them is around enoughness oh my gosh, if I start making more money without working more, am I doing enough? What does that mean? You know, it can be that story of like, I need to work hard to make money, but also a little bit of like, am I doing enough then? And so I find that can be, and I'm sharing this just so, just to help people see like, oh, I didn't even realize that might be something I believe. Um, the other one, which is kind of what we talked on earlier is that, that story around, this means I'm gonna have to take on more responsibility either in the business or outside of the business. I think that can be a really big one where it's like, then I'm gonna have to take care of everyone, which really then becomes around caretaking, right? Like there's a caretaking piece where it's like, I believe I have to take care of everyone. It's not actually about the money. So I use that as an example because that's just another, another place, another lens for money where it's like, it is about the money, but it's really, or about scaling, but it's really not about the money at all. And you can see underneath this, we have some really core themes of, enoughness or I need to work hard or am I doing enough or I need to caretake or it's not safe for me in business unless I caretake or people please and that can just be so helpful again because then we see the real mindset work the real thing to address instead of like trying to like just address the surface 
the surface level piece. And then when we're playing with something like affirmations, we see where we want to create affirmations around the stuff we want to shift. And I think going back to the inner child work, it's really nice because then you can start to look at, oh, what does my inner child need here? Like, what does my younger self need here? What is my younger self trying to tell me? And you can just like kind of get into that observer role, use that as a tool, but really have that as a place where like, I can identify them what the needs, like the thing I need to shift or like what some of the needs I need to meet for myself are. Um, Dante says, I'm good. Thank you. Happy Tuesday to you too. Thank you. And Ruth says, your inner child is the reason for so many of your adult reactions and emotions. It's a really good exercise to journal with who was little Ruth, little Kim, etc. I'm glad to hear that. I'll try it again. I'll have to, um, I'll have to do his other book, Surrender Experiment. So maybe that'll be better for me. Uh, so yes to what Ruth said about inner child work. So, 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 so powerful. And it's so true. Most it's kind of like um, like a really nice way what Ruth put, where it's this whole idea of most of us, the way we're reacting as adults, most of us are reacting, running our businesses from a seven to 10 year old place. And I, I sometimes will tease my clients. I'm like, so would you really let a seven year old make this decision? Would you really let a seven year old tell you how to run your business? Cause that's who's trying to run shit right now. Um, and so I think how Ruth described it is really beautiful. And it's such a good exercise to get clear on who that is. And um, Surrender Experiment, really interesting, Ruth. That one is one I've picked up, not the right time for me. Um, love his work, couldn't get into it. So maybe we'll be in reverse and you'll have to tell me how you like it because I, I just wasn't able to finish that one for some reason. Though, Letting Go by David Hawkins. Oh, talking about Surrender. For the, If you're a client of mine, I've probably sent that book to you. If, if not, um, reach out to me if you want it. If you're watching now or on the replay and for all of you, such a good one. Okay, so we've been talking, I'm gonna wrap this up with a few tools for you. We've been talking about dialoguing with your your inner child, your younger child. I'm just looking, did I wanna, um, did I wanna share anything else? Probably, but we're gonna tie this up in a bow here. So with, um, I think there's a couple ways you can play with it so you can see like doing some of the, the work with your mindset around money. It doesn't always have to be literally about money. And what I find can be really powerful then is when you've uncovered some of this is doing some of that inner child work or looking at how can I get my needs met outside of the way my younger self is trying to kick up a tantrum here. And one exercise I love to do, what we're saying here is like, yes, dialogue with clients around their younger selves. So this is something you can journal around as well. And really, like we were talking about earlier, I have, um, uh, Coach, did the light on this change, y'all? I feel like the flash went off and, okay. Did that change? There we go. Um, see my like face change colors. It gets so dark in here. Um, one of my friends, this is not my idea, so I wanna give credit where credit is due, but one of my friends has her clients do journaling exercises when it's with their younger child in different color pens so that their adult self and their younger self can almost like write in different color pens. So if that works for you, that can be an interesting thing to play with. Something I like to do is to write to my younger self and to thank my younger self and to write like a letter of gratitude or a love letter to my younger self. I also like to write or dialogue with my younger self and remind her that she's safe. So I find a lot of times things come up around safety, especially with money. And so I like to spend some time with my younger self where I'm like, who do we need to forgive? Like, can we forgive them? So we'll do some forgiveness some forgiveness work, but then we'll all also like do the work where I'm like letting her know how safe she is. I'm like thanking her for like trying to keep me safe because that's, that's all your younger self is trying to do, but I'll spend some time around that and letting her know like how safe she is. I'm an adult, I've got her all the ways we're safe. And that can be really, really powerful. Um, I said the forgiveness piece, so I do think the forgiveness piece, I find a lot of times with our younger self too, like there are, sometimes it is a another adult to your younger self that need that we need to forgive or a lesson, you know, like something that came up or something your younger self did. Um, so I think just playing with that and just seeing, is there some forgiveness work you need to do that can be really powerful and that's something um, I give to my clients quite a bit. And then, the last thing here, which we talked about earlier, but I wanted to make sure I, I gave this to you as an exercise is just giving, then whether it's journaling exercise or you're talking about with a coach, really playing with um, what does my younger self need to say to me? Like, if, like, what does my younger self want to tell me? Like, can I just sit here and really listen to him or her? 
it's really fascinating. I think sometimes when we're talking about this like this, if you've never done this before, this can sound almost like weird. I feel like the first time I heard about inner child work, I was like, come on, like, just give me the good stuff. Give me the real stuff. Like, what is this like shit? Um, and I'm saying that because I know there's probably someone watching who's thinking that. Um, so that is probably what my brain was thinking. I find this can be some of the most healing and soothing work you can do. And sometimes you get the most profound insights or ideas where you're like, oh my gosh, I did not even realize this is something I really wanted or this is something I was really craving or this was something I really needed. So just dialoguing, journaling with your inner self, like what do they need? Like, why is this coming up? What do they need from you? What do they want you to hear? Like, what do they want to express? And then I think kind of to what we were talking about earlier, for like what lessons can you uncover? Like, what are your money blocks trying to tell you? asking your younger self what does he or she need from you because that will really give you some insight then into kind of the mindset work or the work that you need to move to that next level with money so if they need more love from you your money work is to go love on yourself more right i think i think that's where you're like no my money work is to like go figure out how to make more money and i want to offer here that means your money mindset work your money work is to go love on yourself more. Go tell your younger self you love her. Go tell your, or him, go tell your adult self that. Go stand in front of the mirror and tell your, lock eyes with yourself and tell yourself how much you love you. That is actually the work you need because that's the reason you're having a hard time making more money or keeping more money or saving more money, whatever's coming up for you. Insert whatever's coming up there. So hope this is helpful for you. I hope this was valuable. If this seems to have any other comments. Ruth says, oh, totally agree. I thought it was airy fairy stuff when I first heard about it. But when you start to work on it, you, um, you realize it's a core activity we should all undertake. I should almost be mandatory to do as a 22 year old, uh, to do it as a 22 year old. So true. It really should be mandatory. They should just do this in high school. Um, this should be like new curriculum for everyone. I, I so, so agree. And I appreciate you for saying that. And for everyone else listening, if you're like, oh, this is very, very stuff. And this is dumb. We hear you, we get you and this shit works. Um, and I think what's nice for me to say to all of you is you can use me as an example. I wasn't always making this money in my business, right? This is all I'm sharing all the things I literally do myself. Not that you have to do the same exact things, but you can borrow and use me as an example. I also, because I only do one-on-one -on -one work, I see the behind the scenes of so many businesses and I see them intimately in terms of what's going on with their mindset because that's a big portion of the work I do and what creates business success. So I can just tell you, I have just seen over and over and over and over again how it's rarely the money, it's rarely about the money. And when we do this work, that's what helps you make more money. Like that's really the real thing. So use that to like borrow from the like benefit of all the businesses I've seen over the years and the mindset behind it. Um, when you're like, oh, but that's so stupid. Um, I get it, I hear you and just give it a try. I always think with anything, with any tool, like this doesn't have to be your tool. There's lots of ways to do mindset work. There's lots of ways to do things. I will, I will say mindset work is like the thing. Um, that's the one thing I will say, but I think it's always like you have nothing to lose to try it. I might as well have my clients, I'll just challenge them to try it for a week. If you don't like it, that's great. We use a different, like there's a million tools. There's so many tools. We can do something completely different. You don't have to do inner child work. You don't have to look at these things here. But I think for anyone watching, I would invite you to just try it on for a week and see how it works for you. No, you got nothing to lose. Like nothing bad is going to happen from that. Worst case, you're gonna do some journaling or worst case, you're gonna do some dialogue and you're like, this is stupid. So I hope this is helpful for you. For those of you who do wanna take this conversation further, who do want some support with your mindset around what's coming up around money and the real stuff, kind of getting to like the thing under the thing and with your strategy and business so you can build, grow and scale a profitable business that you're wildly in love with on your terms. That is what I do, I'm really fucking good at it. I love my clients, I love the work we do. If you're listening to this and you're like, this is weird, probably, you're not gonna love the work I do, but I'm guessing if you're hanging out with me um, over an hour later, we're on the same page. I do have a few client spots opening up, so I will drop a link if that's something you're interested in getting support around. Book a free call with me, we can chat, we can dive into what it is you're looking to get support around and see if it's a fit. I would love, love to connect with you either way. I always tell people there's such low pressure calls and people, even if we're not a fit, I find I've had people like book calls and literally like email me. They're like, so I just had this, 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 and this happen from that call alone. 
So yes, it is a discovery call, but I find you usually get quite a bit of clarity from those calls alone. So I will drop a link for that if that's something you're interested in. If you've been curious about what it would be like to work with me, please feel free to book a call. I would love, love, love to connect with you. And then for everyone, I love you. Thank you for being here. I'll be back next Tuesday and we'll dive into another topic. Bye y'all.